Let us go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you because of your kindness and love for us. We know that we are undeserving, even as we come before such a powerful and awesome God. We pray that as we have sung to you, Heavenly Father, we have danced, we have partaken of uh, the Lord's Supper, just reminding us of the sacrifice of the cross. The Lord, our hearts will be ready to listen to your word. As I share, let your spirit speak through me only for your purposes. And Lord, to bring glory to your name. We know that you've called us to be your image bearers every single day, wherever we go. And Lord, even as we make every effort to know you and to make you known, may we make you known by reflecting your image wherever we are. Thank you for this time. Bless your word. Bless our hearts. We request this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, image bearers. Uh, if we could have the slides, please. Now, to be an image bearer is uh, something that we don't do because we have chosen to, so to speak. But when we look back at, you know, uh, what the Bible says, we from our DNA were created to be like God. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 from verse 26 through 28, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. A rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So of all the things that God created, man is the one who was created in the image of God. So when he says, let us make man in our likeness, we are speaking about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So the Trinity of God, he says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And so we were created from the word go, in the image of God. That means that we are more important than all the other creatures that he puts mankind in charge of. You see, an animal works based on instinct. It has no reason, it has no reason, it has no emotion, it has no relationship or connection, so to speak, like we do. The animals can only follow their instincts even as they do whatever they do. But you and I have what is called the free will. We are given a choice to, you know, we are given the power or the opportunity or ability to make choices. Something that maybe some animals that are created in this world cannot make. We can choose what we want to do. We can choose whether we want to come close to God or not and still maintain the image that he created us to be. In Genesis chapter 5, the Bible says from verse 1 through 3, this is the recent account of Adam's family. Sorry, our Adam's family line. When God created mankind, he made them in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them. And he named them mankind when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. Now, not only did God create man, but man is also to, able to reproduce, you know, uh, offspring that look like them. So we are able to also have, you know, uh, our offspring looking like us. You know, uh, last week, I believe it was, we had a, an opportunity to go to the slopes of Mount uh, Kilimabogo. And we got to the home of uh, our very dear friend, Simon Muya. Uh, there was a goat there that uh, had lost, lost its life, so we needed to go and celebrate <laughs> and pray together. But among the people who came, you know, were Simon's parents. His mom and dad came, so we prayed together. But you could see the likeness. In fact, uh, uh, Simon looks a lot more like his mom, but Tabs looks exactly like her dad. So I'm uh, like, wow, you know, there's a likeness here. You know, when people come to our homes, they see these little people, you know, walking around. Say, Is this your child? Because we look like them. And that's the way people are supposed to see us when they see a Christian. They're like, there's some godliness in you. There's a likeness of Christ. You bear the image of your creator. But somewhere between Genesis chapter 1 
and Genesis chapter 5. There's an incident that threatened that image of God, that Imago Dei, in the likeness of God. And that was the fall of man. When the snake or the serpent came to the Garden of Eden and tempted Eve and made her to now, you know, want to be like God. Say, no, you be wise like God. Man fell from grace. And so the connection that, you know, man had with God, the relationship, the fellowship, that ended. And from that moment onwards, it has always been, you know, God's effort to look for man. Even when Adam and Eve sinned, they didn't go to God and say, oh, by the way, God, where are you? Where are you, Lord? We have sinned. We ate the fruit. It was God looking for them. They were hiding in the bush. The same way when we sin today, we don't come before God sometimes or many times and say how wretched we are. We want to hide to self-preserve. And so from that moment onward, when you look at the meta-narrative, you know, the bigger picture of God's relationship with man, he sent prophets, he sent judges, he sent all kinds of people to try and bring back mankind to a relationship with him. At some point, God was so grieved that he created man because every inclination of man's heart was sinful all the time. So we are created in the image of God to bear his image to reflect God. So everywhere we go, we need to be reflecting the image of God. Therefore, we ought to reflect his glory in everything we do to glorify him. Like the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, so whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. That consciousness as we seek to know God and make him known, is something that we need to learn every single day. That whatever I'm doing is meant to be done for the glory of God, not for my own glory. Not that people may pat me on the back and say, wow, you've done a great job, but rather for the glory of God. So the image of God in man was distorted by the fall. Since then, God has made every effort to have mankind reconciled back to him. And so he made covenant with the patriarchs, you know, Israel, his chosen nation, judges, prophet, uh, prophets, and ultimately he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to try and repair that broken relationship. So let's move on to Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 up to 3. You know, when man fell from, you know, grace with God, uh, if you read the account of the Israelites, when God would speak, you know, to them from the mountain, they were so afraid, they were terrified. And they told Moses, don't let God speak to us. You go speak with God, and we will only follow what God has told you to tell us. And from there, you see, they wanted a king, and they wanted, you know, different things. So they always wanted someone else to stand in between them and God. Today, you and I have a direct access to God through Christ, who is our mediator and our savior uh, for our sins. The Bible says in Hebrews 1 from verse 1 through 3, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom uh, also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the, of the majesty in heaven. So in the past, God spoke to us through prophets. But in these last days, he speaks to us through his son. The Bible says that Jesus is the exact representation of the being of God. So when we make an effort to be like Jesus, we exactly reflecting the image of God. As you know in the, in the book of Acts, the disciples of called Christians first at Antioch. They reflected the image of Christ. And people said, these people are really like Christ. So God speaks to us through Christ today. So as we make every effort to be a Christian, we are learning how to have the image of Christ in us. In Colossians chapter 1, from verse 13 through 15, the Bible says, For he rescued us from the dominion of darkness 
and brought us into the kingdom of the, of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. You see, man has never seen God. You cannot see God physically and live. So God, in helping us to see his image, sent his son Christ as the firstborn among many brothers. And so we are called, like the Bible says, he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So in Christ, we have this awesome opportunity to really learn how to bear the image of God. How can you be an image bearer? Follow the lifestyle of Christ. What did Christ do? Like we're going to say, what would Jesus do? And as we continue learning that, we know that God will help us to be able to bear his image wherever we go. In Colossians 3, verses 9 through 11, the Bible says, Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge. In the image of its creator, here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. So in coming to Christ, there has to be a transformation. We remove the old self with its practices. Everything we used to do before. We remove all of that and put on the new self, being renewed in the knowledge. So we must know Christ before we can make him known. Being renewed in the knowledge, in the image of its creator, so that we can reflect the image of our creator. And says, here there is no Gentile or Jew. You know how you can feel? I don't know if you've ever felt like you're a better Christian than other people. I don't know if you've ever felt that. You hear someone has seen it like a woman caught in adultery. You say, how did that happen? Me, I could never. Yeah? Or okay. Uh, I have nothing against iPhone owners, but if you own an iPhone, let me just say there's a brother one time who told me, you know, I've made many mistakes in life, but I've never owned a techno. <laughs> Amen. All power to you, if that's who you are. <laughs> but you know, sometimes you feel like, man, I have done crazy things, but not some things. That someone did what? When? Where? How? Because you see yourself as someone better. That is always a challenge for us. Even from the communion message this morning. The people came and said, this one was caught in the act. CIA, if you didn't know what CIA means, caught in the act. And they wanted to rally up, you know, people to stone her. They said, okay, if any of you is without sin, be the first one, be the one to cast the first stone. And every time I read that scripture, I'm like, okay, how sinful were these guys really? I mean, the older ones had more sin, maybe the young ones are there, yeah. You know, <laughs> let's end it my way, you know, and then they realize, hey, come on, there, man, I'm not going to uh, let's go off. You know, in the church, we can look at singles because today it's our mighty singles who are serving us. And say, you know what, man, I know we have problems, but not like the singles. <laughs> our singles have problems. <laughs> you see yourself as a better Christian than others. Or you say, man, I know people have problems, but parents, man, parents have issues. And it's true, we do have issues. <laughs> Parenting is hard. You have these little, you know, beings who look at you and you say, okay, go and shower. They look at you and they do something else. They say, go and shower. I say, go and shower. You raise your voice. Then they go, you know, like, so what's the problem? Why can't you obey the first time? And then when you look at the mirror, you realize we're exactly the same way before God. We are sinful. We are wretched. We are worse sometimes than the world. You know, in the book of Romans, Paul, the Apostle Paul writes the church in Rome. And first he begins by looking at, you know, um, at, the, at the world. And he tells the church how, man, the world is, is, is wretched. And people have forgotten God. They do not know God anymore. So he says in Romans, 
uh, chapter 1 from verse 18, he says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. So he's writing to the church in Rome, and telling them, you know, the world is horrible. When you look at our world today, I mean, you see horrible things every single day. You know, failed relationships. Uh, you know, people who are, you know, even uh, hurting their own children. You know, where we live uh, right now, uh, we are new there. We are about almost three months old in our new place. So the other night I had someone say, hey, 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 you know, on the corridor. So we live upstairs and this sound was coming from the stairs. So I opened the door. When I came out, I looked up. Then the, the sound was coming from down. There was this couple in a tussle. The woman had a knife on the neck of the man in the corridor. And the man was saying, call the police, call the police. And she managed to rescue, I mean, to wrestle the knife from uh, her. I said, you see, the knife is here. She wanted to stab me. Call the police. Now, unfortunately, I don't know them. I mean, I, we know our next door neighbor. We've invited them over for tea. We want them to come to church. But this other neighbor, I don't know them. So I said, but who are you? He said, I live here. I said, but how do I know if you live here? You know, I was thinking in my mind, I could be calling <laughs> the police when this guy is the, you know, maybe he's a thief or something. I, I had no idea. And the woman ran back inside, locked the door. So I told the guy, why don't you go talk to the security downstairs? And he went, and I don't know how they sorted out the issue, but I kept thinking, I need to go back and knock on that door. And say, well, I have a message that perhaps can be of help. The message of the grace of God that helps us to understand how we can reconcile even when things are tough. You know, today we are here, we may have our challenges. You know, you may look at them and say, man, how could they fight? And look at the world as wretched. People are lying to one another. They want to kill one another. But as Paul was speaking to these people here, he also helped them to understand that it is not only the world. It is the religious world as well. And he speaks about God's righteous judgment. So let me move back to where I want us to be in Romans chapter 3, from verses 1 through 26. So he says, the world is really bad, I mean, and God's wrath is coming up against, you know, to punish those who are disobedient, who have no excuse not to know God. But he says, but you know what? In the church, we're almost as bad as the world. He says in the church, we look at ourselves as Jew or Gentile, or we look at ourselves that I'm better than so and so. I don't sin like they do. So he says here, that now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew or Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a, a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate His righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. This is the essence of being an image bearer. The Bible says, as Paul writes to the church in Rome, but there's now a righteousness apart from the law. We like to feel justified because we have done certain things. I have come to church. That makes me a good person. Or I have given my tithe. I hope you have. So that makes me a good person. Or I've helped the poor. So the, Jew, the Jews felt like they were better than the Gentiles because salvation came from the Jewish people. The Gentiles were looked at like the outsiders. 
the way some of us feel like, man, you know, I'm one of those old-time religion disciples. You know, when we're singing the songs today, man, it took me back memory lane. I don't know if you're, you're an older disciple, you remember when we used to sing these songs. And actually what I remember when I was singing there was, uh, you know, in front of Nairobi Cinema, in that parking lot, uh, street preaching. Wow. One of those days. And I was so scared. I mean, you know, people are singing, you know, oh, I've been there, oh, I've been there. And I knew I was always going to preach next. <laughs> and man, my heart was pounding. So hard. So that's what I remembered. You know, those days when we would feed the poor in the streets. If you're an old-time religion disciple here, you know. I mean, we'd gather all the street kids and, and, and you know, feed them out there on the streets. Uh, I remember I used to work on um, Koinange Street, like I've told you guys, yeah? During the day. You know. <laughs> and so we'd go for lunch at City Market. <laughs> At City Market, that's where we'd have lunch. And you know, the lunch would have were the fruits that the vendors were selling there. Yeah. And so we realized, man, we can eat fruits and be fruitful. So we set another street preaching right there where people are eating fruits. And me and a, a couple of other brothers, man, we preached there, you know, several times. And there's a gentleman who would always stand at the window listening to us from his office. We said, you know what? These guys may not listen, but that guy, we sent someone, found him, he came, we studied the Bible with him, and he became a disciple. Just like that from the streets. I know the thing that you make you feel like, wow, we are really close to God. But the Bible says, no, our righteousness has come from God that is not by the law. That the people were used to from the Old Testament. Or that the Jewish people were so much, you know, uh, hinging their faith on. But rather, it is one that comes by faith in Christ Jesus. He uses certain words from the past. You know, so if you could go to the next slide, please. He says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God. The word righteousness simply means right standing with God. He was telling the church in Rome, it is how you stand with God, not whether you came or not. How do you stand? Are you standing right with him? Righteousness from, of God has been made known. Uh, to which the law and the prophet testify. says the righteousness is given through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. So if you believe, that righteousness is given to you by faith. He uses the word justification. Justification is a court word. It's used in a court of law. And simply here what it means is that we are all on trial for our sins. We are all guilty. But we have this lawyer called Jesus. And even though we are guilty, he pleads with the judge who is God. And God, the righteous judge, decides to set us free, not because we are not guilty, but because of the lawyer who is standing in our stead, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So through him and faith in him, we are justified. And he says, he uses the word grace. We are all justified freely by his grace. Now what is grace? Grace is forgiveness. Grace is mercy. Where we deserve punishment, but instead we are given freedom. We deserve condemnation, but instead someone is giving you a billion Kenya shillings. and says, you know what, even though you're guilty, but guess what, I'll forget all your guilt. Here's a gift. It is a gift from God. That is grace. Deserving death, yet being given life instead. He uses the word redemption. And he says that freely uh, by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ. Now redemption was something that was done, you know, to redeem something that was taken captive. Let's say you've been uh, kidnapped. And the people who kidnapped you say they want a ransom. So the ransom is paid to redeem what was taken captive. We all have been taken captive by sin. The devil has taken us captive. And Christ says in Mark 10, the son of man came to give his life as a ransom for many. So his death on the cross was the payment for our, our ransom so that we could be kept, you know, uh, set free from captivity. To be image bearers, we must accept that freedom that comes from the redemption of Christ and choose to live for him, 
No longer for ourselves. Atonement. And it says here that God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. When you look at the Old Testament, all the rituals that the people had to go through, once in a year, on the day of atonement, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies, the most holy place in the tabernacle or in the temple. And he would not enter there without the blood of animals, and the blood of a bull, and you know, they would, uh, he would have his priestly robes, he would cleanse, you know, consecrate himself, make sure he's very clean, and then he would go in, and nobody else could go into the Holy of Holies. And the high priest would have this rope tied on his leg. So that when he's there, you know, when you pull the rope and you hear the bells ringing, you know, from his uh, robe, you know, he's still alive. If he died there, you could not go in and bring him out. Because that is the most holy place before God. You could only pull him by that rope. So, atonement meant there was substitutionary, substitu substitutionary death. An animal had to die, and its blood to substitute for your death. The blood of the animals in the tabernacle of the temple were not enough. So God made a new covenant with us through Christ, who is the exact, exact representation of the Father in heaven. The image that we should bear, so that we would no longer have to go through those rituals of the Old Testament, but rather through Christ, through faith in Christ, through repentance, we could live a new life as image bearers. My brothers, we have been given grace to reflect the image of God. How much effect is this grace having in our lives every single day? God has given us grace and grace is more powerful than our sins. It doesn't matter what you have done wrong. It doesn't matter how sinful you feel you are. God's grace is abundant and free for all of us. Let's look at Romans chapter 5. From verse 21. You see, death came because of the fall of Adam and Eve. From that moment onwards, man's days were determined. You could not live beyond a certain time. But there's a scripture, a passage in the Bible where he says, you know, and so and so lived up to this many years, then he died. And then so and so lived up to this many years, then he died. You and I will live up to a certain number of years, then we will die. It is the order of life. So death came through Adam. But we have life eternal through Christ. So Paul, speaking to the same group in Rome, he says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin, by breaking a command as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if all, sorry, for if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through the one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as, for just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through the righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen? 
almost, you know, sounds almost complicated. But in a nutshell, this is what Paul is saying. Death came through the fall of man that is Adam and Eve. Granted, and from that moment on, man, we fell from God's grace, and God had really tried to get us back. But at the time when Christ was sent, you know, to, to be the, you know, the atoning sacrifice, God was pouring out his grace in abundance, overflowing grace. So God's grace is much more than anything you can ever do. It doesn't mean you should continue sinning. But if you're struggling this morning with being an image bearer, maybe in your office people don't see the image of Christ in you. Maybe in your family they don't. God's grace is still available for us. That we can turn back to God by faith in Christ and turn away from our sins. And we will be justified, declared innocent, not because we are not guilty, but because of God's love and kindness to us. The question I have for us this morning is, who does your life glorify? You the created or God the creator? We are called to glorify God in everything that we do. But who does my life glorify? You know, we all like to be, you know, to, to be talked good about, to be praised, and that's not bad. But if that's the oxygen you live on, the comments of others, the likes on your posts, how people treat you wherever you are, then you will really be disappointed the day they don't treat you in that same way. But if we focus on glorifying God, He knows even when we fail. He knows how much effort we're putting in. He knows how much sacrifice we are making. We must be the image bearers by turning back to God. As image bearers, we must make every effort to love like God loves, to serve the same way that he serves us, to forgive the same way that God has forgiven us, to sacrifice the same way that he has sacrificed for us for so long and has never stopped. Every single day, God continues to serve us in ways we do not even understand. Then we can make him known and be his true image bearers. When you are from the family of God and you are making every effort to be like Christ, no one will mistake you for who you are. Brothers and sisters, let us be the image bearers. Imago Dei, in Latin meaning, in the image of God. And through that we can make him known as we demonstrate God's grace in our lives. Thank you for listening. May he bless you.